Grant, thank you so much for joining us on Being Boss. Thank you. I'm looking forward to this. Okay, so before we start to dig in, I have to tell you, every single November rolls around and I start seeing hashtag NaNoWriMo on my social media and it gives me serious hashtag FOMO. (laughs) I feel like I'm missing out on some sort of like cool kids club. So can you tell us what NaNoWriMo is and what your role at the company, or is it even a company, organization, revolution, (laughs) movement, Tell us about it. It is all those things. It's a creative phenomena, uh, and it is an organization. We're a nonprofit, and you are missing out. I have to tell you, you're missing out. Um, <laughs> I can't believe you haven't followed that hashtag into this wonderful creative experience. Um, NaNoWriMo is many things. Um, at its very uh, most basic, it's a challenge to write 50,000 words in 30 days. Uh, it's an event. Uh, but it's also much more than that. It's really, I always say it's a community because part of that, the NaNoWriMo hashtag you're seeing, it's like we we trend on Twitter throughout November. It's uh, part of its success is about the galvanizing force of the community around it. And so um, we say and believe that everyone has a story to tell and that everyone's story matters. So we are, are all about uh, telling people, you know, we want people to embrace that they're writers and they're the creators. I hear too often people tell me I'm not a writer or I'm not a creative type. And we're creative types because we're human beings. Uh, but sometimes people put up obstacles between um, themselves and their creativity. So that's, that's basically why we exist, to ignite people's creative potential. Right. I kind of feel like NaNoWriMo is what is like almost like a writer initiation where if you want to become a writer, like you sit down every day for 30 days and write and you are a writer. You have become a writer. Um, And again, not that you can like become one because I do think that so many people are one, but I do feel like that's like a good, um, a good personal starting point for claiming the title of being a writer. Absolutely. It's like one part uh, writing boot camp. It's a great way to become a writer, actually, because you learn that valuable lesson of showing up every single day to write. You know, that, that is the single biggest writing tip out there. It's amazing that it has to be said, but, you know, do not wait for inspiration. You'll find inspiration on the page when you sit down and write. Um, but other than being at like this boot camp, I think sometimes writing is full of like way too much kind of anguish and masochistic self-inflicted pain. Uh, NaNoWriMo is also a party. You know, this, <laughs> this, this, this community we have, uh, well, one, we break down the mythology of the solitary writer and we add, you know, these fun dashes of, of whimsy and creative co- collaboration to it all. So it really does feel like a party, although at times you are drinking too much coffee and not getting enough sleep. <laughs> that party. Right. Can we talk about this for a second? Because I feel like a lot of people don't identify with that label writer because one, they don't have a cabin in the woods. Mm -hmm. Two, Maybe they don't have a big enough alcohol problem to consider themselves a writer. And I'm kind of joking about this, but what I'm trying to say is that I think that a lot of us as creatives have this idea of what a writer or even a painter or a performer, or whatever it is that you kind of want to do, but don't do because you're letting the identity of what it looks like to be that person get in your way of actually doing the thing. And I think that's what I like about NaNoWriMo is that it's like, no, just do the thing. Sit down, show up, and do the work. So I'm curious to hear from you with your experience. Why do you think it is that people feel like they need to have this identity or the cabin in the woods in order to be a capital W writer? It's a really odd thing. And I think about it a lot because uh, our definition of being a writer is you, you're a writer because you write, right? Like people are runners because they're, they run after work or before work. Um, but I, I think writing has a certain sort of precious notion to it that you're not a real writer. And I hear this all the time and I've been there. I've told this myself. It's taken me like decades to say I'm a writer, literally, um, that you have to be published, that you have to get validation from others, that you have to receive awards um, and all these things that they're great. But, you know, you're, you're a writer and you're a creator because you do it. You sit down and do it. Um, so, you know, when you were starting to talk about the, the log cabin, I would love that log cabin, uh, the alcoholism. I don't want the alcoholism, but I was just imagining this like lonely, decrepit figure up there in the log cabin, just drinking away. And I'm not sure if that's a writer, 
<laughs> I think there's a lot of uh, weird images we have <laughs> of, of creative types. And, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to be, to inhabit your, your identity as a creator. And I think that that's, that's when you're talking about the identity, I think if you want to be a writer, you have to tell yourself you're a writer and inhabit that. And what you'll find is you'll, you'll be um, a much better creator. You'll be much braver on the page as a result. Well, and I also feel like a lot of the problem with people claiming the things, they're not consistently doing the thing. So, you know, you're a writer and you write often, but you aren't living your life with the purpose of writing or you're not making it a daily part of your day. And that's one of the things that I've loved most about watching the NaNoWriMo movement growing is that you're really giving people almost a structure for doing the thing, which allows them to better claim the fact that they're writing. Yeah. You know, I think back to the, 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 the accoutrements of being a writer or the, or the, the things that people feel they need to be a writer. Um, we provide those like less, less sexy aspects of creativity, you know, like you do have to know something or practice time management to accomplish your creative goals. Uh, you do have to have grit and resilience you do have to sit down on good days and bad days, you know, all these things like when people talk about great novels and they'll focus on like the, the wonderful prose, um, the suspense, the dialogue, the characterization, but all of that's produced by these very unsexy, you know, boot campish type elements that, that, a, that a program like NaNoWriMo actually provides. Right. I, the other day, so Kathleen and I finished writing our first book. Now that we're recording and I this, I have to like, say, I still don't feel like a capital I, W writer. I was about oh, to we say, gotta, you, right? At the end of this podcast. Right, yeah. exact yeah. same. But as, as I was prepping for this interview and, and looking back at NaNoWriMo and things, I was thinking, I'm going to do it, one, because I'm going to sit down every day and do it. But I also sat down in my, in my notebook and I wrote like, I am an author. And then it wrote out like what that looks like. And it looks like, it doesn't look like what my current life looks like by any means. And this idea of, of writing every single day, just with the purpose of writing, not to like crank out a newsletter so or we write emails every single day <laughs> or an email, yeah. um, but really writing for the purpose of expressing creativity in a greater way than just cranking out some more words. Um, even though cranking out words does have its own place. Um, but for me, getting super clear on what it looked like for me to be the thing that I want to be gave me a lot of clarity as to what the steps that I need to take to actually feel like the writer that I know that I am. Yeah. What did you write down as your definition of an author? Um, one of them was writing every day. And mm -hmm. I think I might have put I think I might have put a word count on there, like, because mm -hmm. I'm all about metrics and numbers and measuring mm -hmm. the thing. So I needed something to track. So it was uh, writing every day, um, working consistently on my next book proposal. Um, I feel like there was a third thing in there and I can't remember what it was, but small things, honestly, yeah. small things that are very easy to implement. I just got to do it. Right. I think... You know, NaNoWriMo is this big, crazy event where, I mean, people writing 50,000 words in a month, most people can't do that every month. And, and most, a lot of writing, you don't need to, right? Like once you've finished that novel, you've got to revise it. Uh, we believe in revision too. Um, but you know, so, so one of the most frequent things I hear from people who sign up to NaNoWriMo, they'll kind of, they'll, they'll see me someplace and, and walk kind of very slowly and defeatedly over to me hanging their head and they'll apologize for only writing 10,000 words in November. <laughs> and, and, and failing as they, they as they say and I'm, I'm always like no that's not cause that's not a failure that's 10,000 words in a month that's tremendous you just I mean per your metrics time, you know multiply that times 12 you've got 120,000 words in a year that's a huge novel maybe two novels um, so I think sometimes people one of the obstacles they put in front of themselves is uh, the notion that a writer needs like this vast amount of time to accomplish things I mean, as a working parent, I write in the nooks and crannies of my days. So when you're talking about a personal daily word count, you know, only writing 200 or 500 words a day, it all adds up. You know, a, a big things are, are built in, in small increments. And so I think you have to kind of constantly remind yourself of that. For sure. Yeah. yeah, while we were writing our book, I remember there were moments where I was just like typing away at the keyboard and my kid was at my feet 
I'm like, mom, 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 mom. I can't right now. I'm writing. I'm doing it. I'm doing the thing. And I guess in those moments, I kind of felt like a writer a little bit, but it's just so interesting how I have no shame in saying I'm a podcaster, but a writer, uh-huh. I guess because it just is such a special sacred. There is something about words on paper and especially whenever it's being published, there's this permanence to it. And I think it's something that we grow up respecting so much. I mean, how much joy have books brought us in our lifetime, right? So here's what I want to ask you next. Why is writing so incredibly painful? Like if you talk to anybody who's writing a book, you would act like they're being tortured into it. Like it's just the most miserable, awful thing in the world. Why is it so hard? And does it really need to be so hard? That's a good question. Uh, You know, Talking isn't hard, is it? Like, we've been talking a lot. We've been having fun. There's no pain, right? It's, right. We, it, words are being put together. So far, so good. Words. So far, so good. <laughs> some, some, some wonderful words and stories have been told. Uh, and we just do it. And uh, so I, uh, the anguish that comes into writing, I think, when we're measuring ourselves against those capital W writers and feeling insufficient and filling ourselves with self-doubt, because if we were doing this with talking, right, we would be pausing a lot. We'd be really constructing our sentences to be, you know, more beautifully formed. Uh, but we do it just intuitively. Um, and so I think it's a good thing to do. I mean, write, writing is, I think, necessarily full, filled with a degree of anguish, but sometimes I think writers can can uh, over exaggerate that or um, I don't know, embrace that too much as an obstacle. So I think, I mean, one of the premises of NaNoWriMo is like, let's make it fun. You know, there is anguish, but let's make it fun. And there are ways to make it fun. Like one of the activities we do is like to give people a word prompt and five, a five minute word sprint and they write as much as they can in that five minutes. So they're moving their story forward. And it's actually really fun to do that because it kind of feels like improv acting. Um, so there, there, there are a lot of ways that you can make it fun. And I think sometimes uh, we forget that uh, the, a playful approach like, will improve your prose, your story, whether it's a nonfiction book or a fiction book. Um, I also think sometimes we forget that writing doesn't have to all happen in front of the computer with your 10th cup of coffee and your, you know, whatever. If you smoke, your 15th cigarette. Um, Writing. Uh, That's what I need. A smoking <laughs> habit. <laughs> I think, I think you're you're the log cabin uh, type of writer with that with that bottle I'm of wine. I'm gonna start smoking I, I, in November I, and write a novel. I'm, 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 I'm really worried about you. Um, <laughs> if, if you go to that log, I know you're cabin, gonna have to check in with me in December, Grant, and see how I'm doing. Yeah. Well, well that's only if there's cell phone reception at your log cabin. Uh, right. But uh, if, if you're at that log cabin, uh, take a walk every once in a while. Uh, I just did a month-long writing residency where I had really ambitious word count goals. And it was, I was full of anguish. I was starting a new novel. I hate writing rough drafts. That's part of the reason I did NaNoWriMo, so I could revise um, or get into revision more quickly. But I found that my most productive times happened when I took my daily walk at the end of the day. And that's when I had the aha moments, the epiphanies that moved the story forward. So I think that if, if writers, uh, I think it's like anything, if you shift your attitude towards the thing you're doing, you can, you can change it just through your attitude. So I think if you're, if you're um, being burdened by the anguish of writing, I think you need to like take a step back and think about why this is a meaningful activity, like what you get out of it and what you give the world. You know, you're giving yourself something and you're giving the world something by writing. I think part of the anguish probably comes from the rules. So as I was talking about how books are this revered thing in our society and even for, you know, us personally and our listeners, probably our libraries were our havens as children. Um, But also in school, we're taught all these rules around grammar and sentence structure. And I really feel like I found my voice and was able to embrace being a writer more so whenever I could just throw the rules out the window. And funny enough, I mean, we wrote an entire book, Emily and I together, and I think it was less painful for us because we were doing it together and just workshopping it nonstop together. Um, we, whenever we got our round of edits back from our editor, one of the comments that consistently came up throughout the book was, this might sound good in conversation, 
or, you know, as you're talking, but we need to structure a little differently for the words. And it wasn't a big deal. Like the, the edits were minor as far as shifting it from that conversational voice to the actual written word. And it just wasn't a big deal. So let me think, what's my next question from here? What do you think about talking as you're writing? Is that one of the exercises that you ever have or do? Or um, what about like even if you don't have an editor coming back and telling you like, eh, this is kind of okay. Here's what we can do to make it better. Yeah, I think, I think you hit it on the head in terms of like part of the anguish is that internal editor who's speaking to you. And maybe, maybe that internal editor is still remembering those early grammar marks that a, that a teacher made on your paper. Because so much of the way that people learn to write is oftentimes through what they do wrong, which isn't very inspiring, um, instead of like following their passions. And so I'm getting a little bit off topic here, but I think, um, I think the best way to teach writing is, is, is by um, helping kids um, find a passionate entry point. And the, I just want to plug our Young Writers Program on that note because we have 80,000 kids and teens sign up for it every year. We support 4,000 classrooms to do it. And this is all to say that there's another way to, I mean, kids learn best when they, when they are learning through their passions. And so I think that if we all had had that experience, maybe we, our, our writing voice might come out more naturally. Uh, but per like talking out a story, I think that is, can be a great technique for people. I know a lot of people use, um, uh, dictation software for that, or they'll dictate, you know, scenes while they're in a traffic jam or something like that into their phone. Uh, I personally haven't done that, but I think it could be a great uh, technique depending on what you're writing and if you want it to be more conversational. Um, not everyone has an editor, you know, and I think editors are, are just so amazing and, and I, I always want them to even edit like much more, you know, um, deep, deeper than they even go. I just want it all. And it's tough. It's tough to accept that at some times or to see them uh, because we're all vulnerable about our writing. But if you don't have an editor, that's where the community comes in. Um, I think if you're um, inclined to receive feedback from others, I mean, we have a bunch of community resources with NaNoWriMo, but writing communities are everywhere in libraries and schools on the internet. So I think um, it, it is really important to receive feedback, but everybody's different about that too, about what type of feedback they want and if they want it. I actually don't get much feedback until I'm in my very, very final draft. So, yeah. Speaking of conversational writing, one of my favorite authors is Rainbow Rowell. I'm yeah. not sure if I'm saying her name right. And I saw- An NaNoWriMo writer. Yes, that she wrote Fangirl starting in NaNoWriMo. Yeah. So can you share some other, like maybe books we've heard of that started with NaNoWriMo? You know, there are uh, hundreds, if not thousands, traditionally published books, and then thousands and thousands of self-published books that have come out of NaNoWriMo. Uh, Hugh Howey is a big name. He sold millions of copies of his uh, uh, novel, Wool. And uh, he, he, he wrote, he, le he says he learned how to be a writer during NaNoWriMo. Uh, Marissa Meyer um, has written numerous of her novels during NaNoWriMo. Uh, Aaron Morgenstern, um, uh, I'm spacing on the name, but um, um, I can't believe this. Um, I'll tell you well, the name. I have a list talk. right Sarah here. Gruen. Sarah Gruen, Sarah Gruen, oh. yeah. Um, it's so incredible. And so, you know, it's funny looking at these authors and, you know, seeing Wool on this list or seeing Rainbow Rowell on the list and thinking, oh, they were like a capital W writer in my mind, but maybe they started just like any of our listeners might begin or just like we might do it is by just sitting down and they did doing the damn thing. They did. And you know what? They start every novel like that. Um, and Maya Angelou said that, you know, she never felt like a real writer, not a capital W writer, even after all of those awards, all those books she published, you know, writers are always writing with a degree of self doubt. Um, and, and even though you write one big, wonderful novel, you, when you start the next one, it's a new, a new piece. You're starting over. What do you think is the biggest obstacle or challenge to getting started on a new project? I think there, there well, there are a few. On one hand, I think people, um, they tell themselves they're going to do it someday when they've got that wonderful time and they're going to be on a tropical island and, and everything's just going to be perfect for them. And so when you're waiting for the perfect environment or the perfect circumstances, that usually just doesn't happen. And so, um, but, they, but it's easy to fake yourself out and believe that it's going to happen. So that's one reason for NaNoWriMo is like, don't wait for someday to write your novel, write it today. 
Um, let me think. The other what thing about I- you? Like you hate writing rough drafts or, you know, yeah. your first draft. What, what do you feel is like the hardest part of it? Oh, every, every sentence. Of <laughs> Just the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Unless you create, I mean, I'm, I'm bad. Uh, I think one of the great things about NaNoWriMo is that it's all about moving forward. And so you can create momentum. Uh, so that each sentence uh, will build on the other sentence. I always say, I don't believe in writer's block because I think if you write one sentence, it leads to another sentence. Um, and I think that you can also, I used to get caught up way too much in, in, in editing that first sentence or that first paragraph or that first chapter and just doing it over and over and over again and, and w- waiting until it was perfect before moving forward. But the fact is, is like, it's going to get all changed in revision anyway, so it's kind of a waste of time. Uh, the author Karen Russell, and I, almost every author I've talked to says this, that 90% of her rough draft doesn't make it to her final draft. And so I think you have to accept that, that your rough draft is this exploratory period. And that's the thing I love about it is that your story is so wide open. It can go in so many different directions. And it's, if, especially if you've only committed 30 days to it, you're not that attached to it. So you can, you can chop off chapters and revision and, and keep working on it. So... Can we talk about actual creative process for a second? Because I think that one of the things that held me back, probably whenever I was younger, of thinking about approaching a story, especially maybe a novel in particular, like a fictional novel and writing something along those lines, is the idea of, I don't even know all the technical terms. Like I need to figure out all my plot points and my character stories and backstories and like kind of really map it all out before I even start writing. And then I just recently read Stephen King's book on writing and realized, oh, there's another way. Like you can just sit down and start writing and let the story unfold as you're writing it. You don't have to have it all figured out. And the same goes with creative entrepreneurship and running a business. You don't have to have it all figured out. It's great if you do, but if you don't, you can still run a business. And I think that it's really cool seeing other people's creative process. So I'm curious if NaNoWriMo provides any sort of structure as far as like, here are the steps that you need to take for someone that might need structure, or does it also provide flexibility for someone to incorporate their own creative process and maybe even share that within their community? Yeah, I think you hit on uh, one big obstacle. People can, can stay in the planning stage for like a lifetime. Um, and, and, and that can inhibit your writing. Um, so we do, we're, we're not prescriptive. We don't have one approach. We always have this ongoing debate every year about whether people should plan their novels and how much they should plan versus pantsing their novels, which means you're just writing it from scratch and not, uh, don't have an outline or Wait, anything. what's that word again? Pantsing? Uh, pantsing by the seat of your pants. Oh, I thought you meant like pulling pants. someone's pants down. Uh, no. <laughs> That's also pantsing, but a different kind. It it's fine. Taking your kind pants of off and, and, we, and, and I love, we can, we can think about that as a creative process technique, maybe. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, maybe, maybe to overcome, so. maybe overcoming writer's block. But uh, what was I saying? Oh, yeah. No, we, we, cre- we have a lot of resources uh, where we create a conversation around this and help people discover what works for them. Some people really need to have it all mapped out, as you say, and some people uh, get incredibly uh, inhibited by that or, for instance, I, I write and I want to have a sense of mystery about what the story is about, and I'm pursuing that. And so an outline, I feel too hemmed in by that. Um, but I kind of strike a balance. I'm somewhere in the middle between pantsing and planning. I like to explore my novel beforehand as well. Um, and now I've lost the thread of your question. Was there something I didn't answer? Or, oh, the, what we provide. We provide a lot of guidance because NaNoWriMo is a creative experiment, and we want people to experiment every year. And I try to do something different every year as a result. So I think okay, as creators, so- we all have to change. Oh, sorry. Well, I just think as creators, we shouldn't be static in our, in our creative process. And so I always like to try something new every year just to shake it up uh, because I think that that leads to, you know, usually great things or maybe I just know something I don't want to do next time. Yeah, that's a cool idea for like maybe even an established writer or someone who feels really comfortable in their writing process and they have the discipline to get up every day to use NaNoWriMo as an opportunity to explore a new way of doing things. I want to go back to what you were talking about a minute ago around attachment, because I Uh think this is one of those really big obstacles that creatives have and writers especially, or for sure, maybe not especially, around creating the thing and then being so attached to it that you can't let it 
you can't let it go beyond that like first iteration of what you do. And this is something while Kathleen and I were writing the Being Boss book, I lost all attachment to any word I ever write. Like I'm Good. fine, you trashing anything, I don't care, it can go. Um, it, but it our took- editors were shocked when we were like, whatever, delete it. Stop. Right, fine, go. <laughs> And, but whenever we started the process, we were not that great. And I think also us doing it together helped us both get to that place so much faster. Um, do you have any, any recommendations for people who, who struggle with attachment to what it is that they're creating in a way that inhibits them from moving forward? Yeah, there, there are a lot of um, interesting things about the, the concept of attachment. One thing that came to mind when you first started talking about it is that we have an idea that if you work more on one thing, that it becomes better and better and better. Um, there was this interesting um, experiment, the, a, a, a pottery professor, he had one half of his students, they, their whole grade was based on one, one pot for the whole semester. And then the other half of the class, it was based on how many pounds of pots they could create, how many pots they could create. And what he found was the people who were doing, like creating more, they, they, they also created better pots than the ones who just looked at one for the whole time. And so I think that, that there is like, there's something about that kind of over attachment to that one piece and trying to make it perfect. And so I think within that, you have to find a way to shift your attitude and, and to play with it really, to, to experiment within this like concept or this product or whatever it is that you've created. Um, but I think your attitude is beautiful in the editing process, especially, you know, I think, um, it's, it's a tough balance to strike between when you're going to like literally fight for a word or a sentence and when you're going to say, Hey, great. You know, like just not have your ego involved. And so I think that's a, that's a process of practice and self exploration and that we never quite arrive. I will always have that moment where I, where I get a little, um, I don't know, just a little peeved. Um, and, and it's usually my ego getting peeved. Like usually if I take a step back and be like, ah, who cares about that word? Then it's all fine. Right. It's all about choosing which battles you want to fight exactly. for sure. Either either between you and yourself or you right. and an editor or someone who's proofreading for you or just giving it a look through. Um, yeah. But I, I have found that that has also carried over into other parts of my life in ways that I don't hate. Yeah. I have a chapter, I have a chapter in my book that, that's called uh, Hold, Hold Things Lightly. And so it's, it's about that. I mean, it comes from, I heard it on a Buddhist podcast. I'm not even sure who, but it is about that non-attachment. And I think the, that there are, you know, there's a lot of benefits to holding things lightly as a creator. Um, it, it opens your, yourself up more than when you're like really attached, which kind of narrows your vision. So sure. this is actually a really good point to plug your book. I've got oh. it right here too. <laughs> Great. So you wrote a book called Pep Talks for Writers, and this is 52 Insights and Actions to Boost Your Creative Mojo. Oh, wait, before we talk more about your book, sorry, that was like the worst plug ever. <laughs> <laughs> you, did, you did sound a little down. I know. No. It sounded right, like you needed to read the book. <laughs> no, no, the book is great. And I have, I couldn't even decide which exercises to like really dig into on the podcast. Everyone get the book. It's incredible. It's super digestible and um, it really is a pep talk. But what I was going to ask you about NaNoWriMo is that, and I want to make sure I ask you before I forget, I've always seen the hashtag, but I didn't know where to go beyond that. So I wanted to talk about the actual platform and delivery of NaNoWriMo and like, how does it work? Am I getting emails to my inbox? Am I signing up for a forum? Is it a Facebook group? Like, where does it live? All of the above and more. Um, it's uh, NaNoWriMo.org. That's the, the URL. It's all free. We're a nonprofit. We believe everyone should tell their story. So just sign up. And you'll be guided through the website to, it's kind of like a social media site. You set up your profile, you enter the title of your novel, you give a summary of your novel if you want to. Um, you can list your favorite authors, all that kind of stuff. We have uh, vibrant um, forums on the site, uh, about a million posts every November about every topic about writing under the sun. Um, and then you can also like uh, find your local region. And so if you're in, um, I don't know, if you're in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, I'm, uh, there's probably a Tuscaloosa volunteer who's uh, organizing live writing gatherings in the community, or there's probably a library doing that. We have a thousand libraries who host writing gatherings and a thousand volunteers around the world who also host in-person writing gatherings. 
Um, and then, yeah, we send out emails. We send out uh, inspirational pep talks from famous authors every year. Um, we provide, you know, webcasts, whole, whole assortment of resources, a uh, wonderful blog. Um, so yeah, you can discover it all on the website. Um, high five on pinpointing Emily's accent. Oh, right. are you from Alabama? I am. That must be why I said Tuscaloosa. Maybe so. I know I heard that. Yeah. I was like, oh, he must know me. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I swear, so I, I swear it was totally random. I <laughs> I'm from a town called Oskaloosa, and I think that was in my head. So, hey, where's oh, Oskaloosa? It's in Iowa. Oh, Iowa. Where do you say? Now? You don't sound like you're from Alabama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where where are you out of now? I'm in Berkeley, California. That's where we're headquartered. Oh, see, you had to go to Berkeley to become a capital W writer. Uh, yeah. I, I, I love writing in Iowa, actually. It's one of my favorite places to write. And that's where I became a writer. So, I, no, I'm. I became a capital W writer in Iowa. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so tell us, what is one of your favorite exercises, you know, or maybe a handful of exercises from your book, Pep Talks for Writers? Yeah, some of them are very tangible, like a word sprint, uh, you know, just, just, or the Pomodoro method, which is writing for a certain amount of time and just being focused and just produce. Uh, some of them um, are more whimsical. Um, like for instance, Ray Bradbury was, he, when he first started out as a writer, he did this interesting thing where he would write down 20 nouns randomly. And then he would write these little tiny meditations or essays on them. That'd be like 200 words. And then the noun plus the, the little, uh, essay would create a story in his mind. And that's how he wrote some of his, um, his best novels. Um, I think also though, there's, uh, there are, are, there are, um, chapters on, on, on what I was talking about earlier about walking, you know, like being, being a writer isn't just about being at the laptop, like, like, like thinking about ways that you can make your whole day more creative. So for instance, when I'm standing in line waiting for a cup of coffee, what I almost always do is I get this huge impulse to like grab my phone and look at it, even though I've come to realize that nine times out of 10, grabbing my phone and looking at it doesn't make me happy. It doesn't uh, spur on any wonderful creative thoughts. And so I've decided to like accept that moment of boredom as, as a creative, you know, I think creativity happens from boredom because when your mind is bored, it's searching for stimulus. And, and it's an opportunity to observe other people, eavesdrop on them, just think about things. So I tried in the book, I mean, there are 52 essays. It's, it's, it's purpose is to help people be creative year round, not just in November. Uh, so I try to touch on a lot of different aspects of creativity and how you can approach every day and every week as a creator. Yeah, I love how digestible it all is. Whenever I was oh, flipping through it, I love the idea that, and, and they all hit on on particular pain points for not only writers, but creatives. One of the ones that I love the most and one that like really hit home for me was around thinking fast enough to outpace writer's block or creative block, whatever that may be. Cause that's one of those that I find myself in a lot is I will sit and just sort of wait until I can't do it anymore. So yeah. I love that there were so many little exercises um, and so many good like thought points um, that uh, in some way you're going to hit on someone's need for a pep talk for sure. I'd better. I'd better. <laughs> if, you, if I don't, I'll refund. I'll refund your book. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> Out of 52 essays, if not one is pertinent. Um, yeah, but I think you hit on a, on a, on a crucial point, you know, too many people wait for inspiration as if it's this magical thing that, you know, but inspiration strikes at least with a big, bold thunderbolt just so rarely, you know? Um, I mean, I think you create inspiration. Uh, you sit down and you write and, and your words on the page, you know, like you said, you write one sentence, you create momentum for the next sentence, you know, and that, that momentum builds. Um, and even though sometimes you don't recognize that, cre that inspiration, I think the most meaningful inspiration are those like little tiny small moments that keep guiding you. It's not the big thunderbolts necessarily. That's what I was about to say. I've never had a big thunderbolt. I mean, even this podcast, which has been one of my most successful projects to date, which led to a book, started with a really simple email, just like many emails I had received from Emily before. You know, it wasn't like this huge yeah. thunderbolt of like, and here's what we're going to do and here's what it's going to become. But even on the daily, we were talking about walking and walking is whenever I find those little buzzes of inspiration yeah. all the time. Whether or not, I usually like listening to a podcast while I'm walking, but that gives me something to kind of riff on and new things mm -hmm. to think about. 
But whenever I allow myself to get bored and not listen to anything on a walk, I kind of drop into this meditative state and I do find myself getting a little more creative. So <laughs> even just the other day I was on a walk and this man was kind of walking a little bit aggressively down the other side of the street. And I thought, oh my gosh, does he have a knife? What if he had a knife? I would run up to this house and knock on the door and then maybe they would let me in. It's like a really sweet old couple, but what if they're actually the killers? And he was actually trying to like... I don't know, get revenge on them because he's like their long lost son. Anyway, it turned into a novel. I'm not yeah. even a novel writer. You're ready to go. You're I'm ready, ready to go. go. That's this gonna be my effort. Effort. jump on that hashtag. Well then I got too scared. <laughs> Your like worst case scenario, like drill downs that happen, because I've heard them live happen several times, would make some incredible scary short stories, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll send them to Stephen King. Um, but one of, I was going to ask you, like one of the pieces of advice that I seem to see over and over again from really successful creatives is to take risks and to be innovative and take risks. But I don't know what that means. Mm -hmm. so can you shed some light on that? Like, what does it mean to really take a risk? And maybe I'm risk averse and have found a way to be creative around it. But I'm just trying to figure out, like, how do you how do you be risky? Is it by dropping the F bomb in your novel and you're kind of scared to do that? Or is it something else? Like, what does it mean to take a risk? Or maybe you could even share insights on where you've taken risks in your work or maybe some um, of the writers participating in NaNoWriMo have taken risks. Yeah. Well, I definitely think writing NaNoWriMo style, which is that kind of improvisational um, writing, the, the improv will lead you to taking risks just naturally and writing fast and moving forward. But short of that, I always say, I think, I think the best stories, I think the stories we relate to the most and the ones that are the most meaningful in our lives are the ones when the author has been the most vulnerable and really laid it out on the page and really opened up. I, I just read this quote by Scott Fitzgerald who said, let me think, um, the best stories are the ones you're ashamed of. If you're ashamed of something, write it. So I don't know that that necessarily means uh, dropping a lot of F-bombs. Uh, maybe that does, maybe that is taking risks for some people. Uh, but I think it's more about like asking yourself, uh, what, what is the truth that you want to write about? You know, and how are you going to write about it? And what's the best form to put that in? And so when you're asking about like um, examples of authors, you know, William Faulkner wrote these crazy stream of consciousness novels, you know, that, that, that just touched on these, all these deep personal layers and layers of history and layers of history of the nation. And, you know, they're, they're, he took risks, you know, no one was cry crying out and saying, hey, the next trend in novels are stream of consciousness, big, messy stream of consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> and the same thing with like an author like Lydia Davis, who's the exact opposite. opposite. She writes for this extreme brevity. Like who would imagine that you could write a story in a sentence or two or a paragraph, uh, but she does it in this very particular compelling way. Um, so I think that those writers ask themselves about what is their truth and how to convey it. And they created these different forms and took risks as a result. Does that help? You don't look like I no, can. No, it does help. I, I've, I've just been thinking a lot lately about the conversation around being original and taking risks. And I think that sometimes that can alienate people from just yeah. even getting started, I suppose. It's true. That's why I think like just that idea of what is your truth and how do you want to express it? It's a little bit different than saying I'm going to be original. I think uh, that idea of originality is uh, perhaps overrated. Oh, I was just going to say that I was listening to a podcast recently with Roxy M. Gay, and she yeah. just wrote that book, Hunger, and she was saying that as she was kind of digging down into that what's true and, you know, really getting to the truth of things and that vulnerability, and it came around to writing about her body, and she's like, I can't write about that, and then she was like, oh, shit, I got to write about that. And she's so, changing all. <laughs> right. She is. Okay. Emily, do you have any questions? I don't think so. I think I'm good for the moment. Okay. Um, I guess what I would like to ask you next is what are your top three tips for becoming a better writer? So even moving beyond the let's get started phase, let's do NaNoWriMo, let's move fast and fail fast and write fast and just do all the things. <laughs> slow How down. do we actually become better, right? <laughs> you got to slow down sometime. <laughs> Um, yeah, I've touched on a lot of them. Um, you know, I mean, 
and a lot of them are kind of boring. Like, like you said, like just show up and write. People say that a lot. Read, 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 read. People say that a lot. Um, I think my favorite ones are the ones like the be vulnerable. You know, I think you're going to connect with people. And I think people sometimes like they they think being a writer is reading all those how to books, right? Like how to write dialogue, how to create plot, how to create suspense. Well, those are all great. And those are all crucial to a good story. But like I was saying earlier, being vulnerable, you can't teach that necessarily. You have to work on that in your writing and explore it. Um, I think sometimes uh, I touched on this earlier too, but playfulness. Like, why not take some pauses in being playful with your creative spirit, with the words on the page, or just in a different way? Like, get away from your laptop and find different ways to be playful in life, and it will influence your writing. Um, let me think. This is like I, I have a couple thought. of questions about vulnerability and like Go writing ahead. a novel or writing fiction versus writing nonfiction. So, in my mind, I can really see clearly how I would bring vulnerability to a memoir or even to a blog post, for example. But whenever it comes to writing a novel, do you think it's easier to be vulnerable because it's under the mask of a character, or do you think it's harder because um, it's not? quote unquote real yeah uh probably both depending on the author i think there is uh fiction does allow you uh, this wonderful shield where you're like that's not me that's my character you know <laughs> or that's not my mom your that's spouse or yeah your spouse your or your spouse. family reads the book and they're like is yeah. this me no oh, oh no no that's, yeah. <laughs> You think it's you because you're projecting. Yeah. You know. <laughs> because you're guilty. <laughs> yeah. Is it, yeah. Yeah, is I think, it you? I, I think uh, Annie Lamott said something like, if you don't want to be in my novel, then behave better. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right? I yeah, love that. So, so there's that. Um, let me think. I'm losing the string. Oh, about the about the, being being vulnerable. You know, there's this rich history of authors also who have written through a persona. And they've chosen a persona because a persona is empowering them and allows, allows them to go deeper than, than, than writing, you know, through the mask of who they really are. Because uh, we all are writing through some sort of mask. Yeah, that's even one of the tips in your book is to dress to be the writer that you want to be. And so I love that, like putting on my writing outfit, going to a coffee shop. Yeah. Writing out my cigarettes a, and whiskey on the way. I know. On your way to your cabin. What are you wearing? <laughs> right? Uh, cabin, you know, you're just wearing your bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was a somewhat uh, whimsical and playful chapter, but I also think uh, it's, it's the metaphor speaks large because I think we, we oftentimes we dress in a certain conformist manner. And I think our writing side can be a more like you can do it more bravura style or with more flourish or do it bigger or just inhabit, you know, a different creature or a different persona. And so, uh, yeah, dress like the writer you want to be. They've even done these studies where they'll put people in lab coats and have them walk around through their day. And just by having a lab coat on, they become, you know, more better more, writers. <laughs> maybe <but> they, become, <laughs> they become more serious. They have a different gravity towards the things they, they do. And that's because they're just wearing something different. So I think if you want to be um, whatever, more uh, whimsical in your writing, you might want to think about, you know, uh, I love that. I once went to a bar wearing scrubs uh -huh. that I got from a friend because, <laughs> yeah. How did it because I wanted respect. And so we were all calling, like me and a couple of my friends, like we all got these scrubs and went to a uh -huh. bar and we were all calling each other doctor. <laughs> yeah. Saying shit like, get me a drink, stat. But we really felt it. So I could I see like, I don't know, maybe that's this good, exercise was written just for me. Yeah, that's a good writing exercise. Uh, I, I like that in particular. Like, <laughs> just go to that bar in a different outfit. In right scrubs. there's a there's a in there's scrubs. a storyline there there somewhere and your most comfy shoes oh there's a total storyline there i can i can write a novel about that in an afternoon right there you go um yeah. i i do want to go back to something you were talking a minute ago about one of one of your tips being more or less just like live your life and go out and do things that was one of the things whenever kathleen and i were really diving into writing that we found was mandatory 
for us to be able to crank anything of semi quality out was we actually had to make living our lives more of a priority than we do on any other day. Because the act of writing, of getting those things out of you took so much more out of us that we had to refuel in mm-hmm. ways that we don't usually have to refuel when we're just writing emails or designing a thing or what, or recording podcasts. But there was so much more intensity that went into writing that we had to be more intentional with actually living our lives so that we could write the words. Emily, I was just journaling about this yesterday that, okay, so I actually kind of want to talk about journaling and the writing process too, not to jump on your point, (laughs) Emily, but it actually ties into your point where sometimes I feel like even as creative entrepreneurs taking this beyond writing, if you, or, you know, even writing, if you spend all your time doing the work, whatever your work looks like, it's hard to have I don't want to say inspiration because we talked about how inspiration comes whenever you show up, but it's hard to have any sort of fodder, I guess, even, um, or new ideas or new thoughts. So I'm curious, like I was journaling about this. I'm like, man, my journal is so boring. It's like, I got up, I did the work, I gave my kid a bath, we went to bed and it's kind of that every single day. So I'm kind of curious, um, Grant, if you use journaling at all, or if any of your NaNoWriMo writers use journaling and how that kind of plays into the creative process, or even just living life, like going on trips, um, even beyond just the daily walks, how that really like plays into the writing process. Yeah, I do feel, going back to Emily's point, that it's really important to live life and to think about how you want to live it and to have new experiences. I mean, travel, they, they you know, just going to another country, experiencing the way that they live and how they live differently and their, and their language. It, they've, again, they've done these studies that you know, people's minds open up and make different connections. And that's largely what creativity is about a juxtaposition of all these different thoughts at once and then you kind of bring them together. Um, so that's really important. However you want to define living life, um, I think that that's gonna, gonna help your creativity a lot. And then let me see, journaling. Um, I, I've journaled since I was like seven years old. And the journal has taken uh, many different forms and had many different needs. I actually, like you, find it much more challenging now that I'm a working parent. Um, It's a much less (laughs) riveting journal, I think. Much less, you know, I I don't really... There's like not enough time to be angsty or (laughs) any of it. I know. I feel so bad as a journaler that I'm not living up to my angst, you know, the necessary angst that whoever reads it will need. But um, Not enough whiskey and cigarettes. I know. And then I just bought David Sedaris's new book, which is like a journal. Well, he's the... Oh my gosh. David Sedaris is the ultimate role model of, of a journaler because he writes these amazing meticulous journal entries every day. And he has this really, um, you know, regular routine with it. Um, And then he draws from those journal entries to write his essays or whatever he's writing. And so he'll write down, like he'll, when he does a a book tour, he'll write down all these observations about the people who he signed books for. So the journal is a tool for helping him to be attuned to the world. And that's ideally the way I want my journal to be too, is to, be attuned to the external world, but also be attuned to my internal world. So I'm, I've, I've been very inspired, inspired by David Sedaris and want to practice journaling more like he does. I, you know, and I yeah. think it's funny that we can even get inspiration not from just the books that we read and how we want to write and trying on different styles for size, but even trying on different journaling styles for size. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think the weird thing is like when you mention, I think you mentioned a reader of your journal. And I, for so many years, wrote my journal without the idea that anyone would ever read it, you know, but I saved them all. I still have them all. Uh, But once I had kids, I realized that they might indeed read it. Um, And and it kind of became an inhibitor, actually, because when I wrote, I kept thinking of them someday reading it. Now they're old enough and, you know, they're using the occasional profanity and stuff. So, you know, now I'm I'm liberated. I'm like, (laughs) these kids are emerging into adult. They can handle this subject matter. You know, I'm not joking, but, you know. (laughs) <laughs> right. who, knows? No, totally. who knows maybe they'll just throw them out maybe they'll come in after i've died and just clear out the closets and be like what the hell you know i've always thrown mine out yeah. i found one from whenever i was eight and it was like the worst thing that could ever happen is getting a divorce and i've been divorced like young it was i got it out of the way early starter marriage no big deal yeah. and just seeing my eight-year-old having anxiety over getting a divorce one day it was just kind of cracked me up. I wish I had saved more through high school and college even, but I always just 
find myself so embarrassed by them that I throw yeah. them away. I've, I've never read a word of one of my journals. I would be, yeah. Mortified. I, I wouldn't want to be a writer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is a question about books too. And I think another thing that makes them so intimidating is that they feel so permanent. And that was something that I definitely still struggle with, with our book being boss coming out in the spring is, did I say what I needed to say? Did I say it in a way that will not be misunderstood? Is it going to be helpful? And there, that's it. Like there's no second edition or there may be a second no. edition with like a few tweaks, but like this is it. It's in the world. It's not like a blog post that you can delete or a podcast episode where the nature of it is uh, conversational and fine. So what do you think about, you know, even in your experience as an author, the permanence of writing and how do you get over that? Yeah, it's funny because I think I was just thinking about this today, coincidentally, about how, uh, you know, myself as a writer, like I, I like to think well, I, I'm improving, right? Or, or that you just go through different stages in life. So that, that thing that you published 10 years ago, it's, it was a very much younger version of myself, somebody who is a different self, really. Um, I think you just have to accept that that's all part of the creative journey. And there's a wonderfulness to it. I mean, so many authors, their, their first books are actually their best books, um, or can be. Uh, so I don't have any answer. I mean, I think you have to live with that permanence. Um, just get over it, Kathleen. Yeah, it's there. Yeah, just get over it. Yeah, <laughs> get your, go to your cabin and drink that whiskey. And, yeah. I'll <laughs> just be reading pep talks Read for pep writers. Talks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there, that can be your, your 53rd pep talk, or if you want to do like second volume, we might getting do over whole... permanence. Oh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> right? That's good. I, I thought you were going to mention the cabin. I was going to say we can do a little... Uh, you know, oh travel my gosh, tour. will you please this will do be an for exercise? You yeah, we'll just, we'll just bring writers up to see Kathleen in the cabin. We'll <laughs> look through the windows and kind of I'll say I'll serve up some whiskey, me yeah. whiskey and cigarettes. It'll be I'll real, roll you a cigarette. The real writer tour. The real writer yeah. tour. Love it. Grant, thank you so much for coming to chat with us about writing and the process and NoRimo. I hope that I hope that all of our maybe not all of I, actually I hope that all of our listeners oh, decide yeah. to write some things. Every single one for of them. Sure. Yeah, Go write it, something. Make it a requirement before they listen to this podcast that they have to sign up. <laughs> we'll do. Love actually, it. we'll just put that in the beginning that yeah. if they complete the episode, they have to write, period. Yeah. Love okay. it. Love it. Um, we have one more question for you. Good. And that is, what makes you feel most boss? I, um, I forget when I started this, maybe five, six years ago, I decided to do one thing that I would possibly feel uh, embarrassed by every year. Uh, so it doesn't have to be anything extravagant, but it just has to be something that stretches me in an entirely new direction. So for instance, one year, I did an improv class. Um, one, one, one year I was a model in an art class. Um, I've thought about doing a stand-up comedy routine one year at an open mic, just because I think that that is like the toughest thing in the world to possibly do. Yeah, and you could do. talk about your stint as a live model in art class. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. You're exactly. living your life to give yourself things to write and talk about. Exactly. But I think, I think, I think, I um, think, everyone should make themselves uh, uncomfortable from time to time. And that's the main premise of it is that by being uncomfortable, especially in front of other people, you're, you're learning something about yourself and you're actually building new skills too. Um, and most of this doesn't matter. Like your permanence, like people forget, they don't really, they're not keeping score like you think they are. That's so true. Yeah. All right. Where can people find more about NaNoWriMo and where can they find the book? Yeah. So uh, NaNoWriMo.org. Just go there on the internet or search for NaNoWriMo. Uh, the book uh, it comes out October 3rd. It's going to be in hopefully all bookstores or most bookstores. Uh, definitely on Amazon. Definitely on the Chronicle Books website. Chronicle Books is the publisher. Um, yeah, and I'll be posting, you know, things on uh, my website, grantfaulkner.com, and on Twitter, at Grant Faulkner, and a bunch of other places, too. But Is there yeah. any relation to William Faulkner? Um... No. 
There's a, I, was, I, was think, I, was, I was considering I was like, holy I was shit. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was yes, thinking, I'm his great yeah. grandson. Yeah, I was, I, well, I, I, I've been asked that thousands of times in I'm my life. I'm sorry. No, Ugh, no, no, no. The worst. No, you're not. You're not. It's fine. I just, I told, I told, I decided that I would give myself one opportunity to lie about it. Oh, <laughs> you were wondering just uh, now if this would be the well, time? Maybe the second time. <laughs> I, I, uh, is this it? I, I lied. I, I lied it. once. I lied once on a red eye flight, and it all it backfired. And was that oh. to the mother of your children? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been funny, though. Uh, it's a long story, but um, yeah. Backfired. It's gotcha. It's backfired. Oh man. Gotcha. Right, and thank you so much for joining us on the show. It has been so fun talking to you. Yeah, likewise. A lot of fun. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to our team and sponsors who make Being Boss possible. Our sound engineer and web developer, Corey Winter. Our editorial director and content manager, Caitlin Brain. Our community manager and social media director, Sharon Lukey. And our bean counter, David Austin, with support from Braid Creative and Indie Shopography. Do the work, be boss, and we'll see you next week.